Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I am talking with Lars Chitka. Lars is a professor in sensory and behavioral ecology at Queen Mary University of London. He is a PhD in biology, and he is also the founder of the Research Center for Psychology at Queen Mary University of London. He's been an editor of biology's leading open access journal, PLOS Biology, and he's also been on many uh, editorial boards. He is a recipient of the Royal Society Wolfson Research Merit Award, um, and he is well published within the literature. Um, and most particular, he is one of the world's leading experts on bees. Um, and he is the author of the latest book, The Mind of a Bee, and that's what we talk about in this conversation. Uh, we start by talking about the individuality of bees, how they're all unique and different, and how we know that and understand that. He gives an overview of kind of the evolutionary history of bees, starting in the Triassic period. We spend some time talking about vision in bees. We talk about aspects of polarization, sun compass, phylogenetic analysis, and many other aspects. We talk about the antenna and how they sense. We talk about the sociality of bees. We talk about bee brains and their intelligence and then how they've uh, been able to measure personality of, of bees. We talk about robot bees. And we also talk about bee conservation and the future. I have to say, uh, I say in the conversation that um, I'm one of those people that is interested in different things, although bees don't usually come up at the top of the list, but I absolutely um, just inhaled essentially his book. Uh, his book is wonderful. It's well written um, and it has so much information. Um, I'm <laughs> at reading the book and talking to Lars. I I would be surprised if there's something he doesn't know about bees. He knows everything about bees. Has a great way of explaining it. He's a great communicator. Um, and it really is an absolutely fantastic book. His research is, is really, really wonderful. Uh, to understand more about bees, of course, but also where they fit in the environment, and in our context. Um, and how do we as humans, you know, how can we interact uh, with with bees in, in the world and how we can respect them and have some conservation efforts as well. And so um, he's, he's just absolutely wonderful. And I'm really, really happy to bring my conversation with Lars Chitka. I'm here with Lars Chitka. Lars, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I've been uh, really looking forward to, to speaking with you. You're very welcome. Nice to meet you. Yes, yes. Um, you've written a, a, a really a marvelous book. Uh, so I will say that I'm I'm not a, a big bee enthusiast. I'll, I'll lay my cards out on the table, but the way you wrote it, uh, how how it was organized, um, really made me appreciate <laughs> bees much more than I did, and it, it really was just uh, kind of eye opening in a lot of ways. So it's a it's a, it's a quite marvelous book. Thank you so much. That's very kind of you to yeah. say so. Yeah, yeah. So the book is called The Mind of a Bee, and it is a uh, beautiful cover uh it's absolutely gorgeous and it's got all these really nice colored pictures in it and so it's 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 really it's really fabulous um so before we get into the contents of the book just tell listeners uh who you are what your background is what you study um and and where you're at currently all right so my name's lars chitka i'm an, i'm a professor of sensory and behavioral ecology at queen mary university of london and I've studied bees for well 35 years approximately, starting with their color vision, then uh, their interactions with flowers, and then in recent decades their psychology. And and you currently you you do just uh, do you teach and research or just research or currently what are you or you have uh, more books that you write or what is it like kind of your what's like uh, so what's your nine to five day job. <laughs> Uh, it's it's both teaching and research. Okay. So it's a regular sort of university academic job of uh, of blending teaching and yeah, of research course. and and uh, a million hours of administration. <laughs> um, yes, yes, yes. I hear you. <laughs> I'm great. on sabbatical this particular year, so I'm I'm currently living in paradise until September 2023. Well, you're you're not going to want to go back. So, <laughs> oh, why did I do this? Why did I come back again? I should just stay where it was. 
Uh, or maybe you'll maybe the opposite. Maybe you'll be really itching to go again. Just get on, get into the into the research again. So this book, uh, this came out, I think this year, correct? Came out this year. Uh, in July this year. That's correct. Yeah, yeah, earlier this year. I remember it came out earlier this year. Um, okay, so the I just start with what I understand is the central thesis of of the book. So the the main thesis here is that each B uh, has has a mind. Uh, self awareness, perspective, memory, and basic emotions. Um, that might be really surprising to people. That it has a uh, uh, an, an insect, an animal that is so small um, that can have all of these things that you know uh, humans have and other other animals have. So, how do you just briefly a broad overview? How did you come to these conclusions that bees have such uh, complex minds uh, in, in many ways? So a small qualifier at the start, perhaps. So this is not a firm conclusion. It's something that emerged between the lines from my research. Mm. This is the final chapter of the book, and it's admittedly the most speculative one. Mm -hmm. But what this chapter is built on is decades of research on bees' intelligence. So our team, as well as several those of several other colleagues, have discovered over the decades that bees are very intelligent as individuals, that they can count, they can recognize images of human faces, they can use tools, simple tools at least, they can copy tool use from other individuals in their environment and form simple categories of classes of visual objects so that they can, let's say, classify images into trees and non-tree objects are symmetrical and asymmetrical objects and so on. And after doing this work for decades, I and some colleagues were beginning to scratch our heads and asking, well, if they're that smart, maybe they also have sentience, some form of basic emotions, and maybe they also have consciousness. And mm. so this was initially just a relatively a vague thought that I then became interested in, well, how might one demonstrate such a thing as mm. the consciousness and sentience in an insect? And so in many cases, we then borrowed paradigms from classic, iconic models of animals' intelligence, such as primates and corvid birds in Seawell. Without lowering the bar by the same criteria, does it look as if bees might have such things as well. And that seems to be at least likely from our experiments. Mm. Yeah, it's it's it has to be terribly fascinating to to do so much research for so long, many decades, and to start kind of seeing these pieces together come alive and what what that then means for, you know, how we understand, you know, bees or other insects and then other animals as well. It's just the more we do research and we say, well, it's this, this, uh, these aren't just impulses or these aren't just kind of reactions. There's a lot more going on. Uh, this is super fascinating. One thing you mentioned in the book is that um, many times people talk about bees as a collective, but you also say some things about them and their individuality. So what can you say there about the individuality of, of each unique bee? So pretty much all our work is done with individual bees that are made recognizable either with little number tags or QR codes or RFID chips. So we know which bee is which. And once you do that, you instantly recognize, well, they all look alike at a glance, as opposed to a non-expert for sure, that their behavior is profoundly different between individuals, and you also realize that as individuals, they can be taught to do certain things. They're very good learners, um, and that extends from relatively simple task that every bee has to solve in its daily life, such as learning which flowers are rewarding, where is my, my hive. Uh, they have to be good at these tasks because they do them on a daily basis. And they have to solve them as individuals. No one will otherwise show them, give them directions back to their hive, for example, or their nest if they've lost the way. So they have to memorize it as an individual. And 
Likewise, while at least in social bees, though not all bees are social, in social bees there are certain forms of communication about, for example, which flowers to visit. Mm. But they also, of course, someone has to acquire the information in the first place. So even in those bees that have these kinds of communication systems, there have to be bees that do the scouting, that compare, let's say, different flowers, flower species for their nectar and pollen offerings, remember the signals that advertise these flowers as individuals. And then, of course, they can come back to the hive and um, and inform other bees of the location of these flowers. But all of the information acquisition is done by individuals, not the swarm as a whole. Mm. The, the group capitalizes on the individual scouting capacities of single bees and as a whole, of course, there's much more knowledge in a bee colony than, than ever could be in any one individual. And they seem oftentimes to operate as one, well, almost as one individual where you could, I guess, metaphorically view the individual just as a, as a, as a part of the swarm intelligence. But if you look closely enough, at what these individually marked bees do in nature, as well as also in our laboratory conditions, then all or pretty much most of the information processing is done by individuals and then fed into the collective for further information processing, I guess. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, when I when I read this, uh, parts of this in the book, I, I had no idea. I feel like most people wouldn't really think about bees in their individuality. And so... It, I mean that alone, you know, it makes me when I see if I'm out outside in my in my in my neighborhood and I see a bee and I see it just by itself, you know, there's a way in which you kind of just approach that much differently now than knowing something as simple as that, as opposed to, uh, you know, whatever whatever you know kind of stock opinion might be, and that's just for me as a layperson. So obviously, for people that are closer to this, like yourself, that has to be. That's such a big world that opens when you can kind of see all of these things and their and how they're doing things individually. Yeah, I mean, I think that even beekeepers often don't realize the miracle that happens if an individual bee leaves the hive, flies mm. away ten kilometers, mm. and and then finds her way back after an excursion that might take two or three hours. Mm. We did an ex a kind of outreach experiment or project a few years ago where we labeled a few thousand bees of multiple species, several species of bumblebees, but also honeybees with individual number tags that are large enough for, for everyone to read and let them and put the colonies onto the roof of our building so they could fly all over East London. And we had a little photo competition um, and so on. And so people could observe these bees visiting flowers in their gardens. Mm. And not only that, of course, because the bees have memories for the flower patches that they visit, they would come back several times a day for multiple days in a row. And people could log these observations on an interactive web page. And this appreciation that bees are individuals with individual memories and preferences for a particular flower patch in your garden i think open people's eyes quite a bit because yeah as you say often when you just casually observe an insect visiting a flower it just seems like well some some sort of entity that drifts aimlessly across the landscape and might uh, sort of opportunistically drop out of the sky when it sees a flower and flower and then moves on but they're actually very methodical in memorizing certain flower species certain patches and coming to prefer those ones that offer the the highest rewards yeah yeah it's 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 really it just it opens up a new way of, of looking at bees so there's so many things i want to get into vision spatial memory these things but let's just kind of do kind of a <clears throat> a general kind of i guess uh uh, uh statement or overview of the uh evolutionary history of bees so you don't have to go super in detail or whatever but just a kind of just an overview of 
we think that bees have their origins in the Triassic period. So for listeners, this was you know, right before the Jurassic, right before the, the age before dinosaurs, you know, lived and then died. Is that right? About right? Triassic period is where we first see maybe probably their origins and then all the way up until uh, present day or what's the kind of story there? Yeah, you're right. So for all we know, um, around the sort of Triassic, Jurassic boundary is when bees first emerged. Now, of course, such records are typically incomplete because, because you have to be very lucky to find a fossil that's survived that long mm -hmm. a period, especially if it's of a creature as tiny as a bee. Now, dinosaur bones are something else. They're, they're extremely rigid and and um, and uh, well strong structures whereas of course the same can't be said of of a tiny insect so what we know is often based on a handful of or even individual enclosures in ember and so it might be that eventually and over the decades that um, the age of bees of the earliest bees might be pushed back further but for all we know they arose about 200, 212, 20 million years ago. Mm. And they didn't come out of nothing, of course. Um, you, you probably know that bees are related to wasps. Mm -hmm. And indeed, they, they are wasps in a sense. They're, they're, mm. The entire diversity of bees emerged from a wasp-like ancestor, for all we know. And which was solitary, so it was not a social insect, but a, a solitary one. And these ancestors of the bees, unlike um, the bees themselves, the vast majority of which, of course, have a kind of vegan lifestyle in that they find all of their nutrition from flowers, pollen and nectar. These ancestral wasps that predated the bees were not just carnivorous, but had a special um niche inside um the, the bigger realm of carnivorous insects and that's that they were parasitoids um not parasites but so the term means that it's um so parasites typically don't kill their host mm -hmm. uh, they might as a byproduct of their activities but they don't intend to so to speak whereas in the parasitoid lifestyle the death of the host eventually um, is part of the plan, so to speak. And so what happens with these parasitoid wasps is that they typically, in many cases, paralyze the prey to render it immobile and helpless, but, but, um, but fresh so that it won't decay. And so the prey is kept alive. The wasp lays its eggs on the prey, often in a kind of burrow or a nest where the the prey is hidden, so some other predator can't steal it, and then the the wasps' eggs hatch and the larvae um, munch away on their on their living prey until they've uh, consumed so much of it that it eventually dies at the very end. Um, and this is the 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 ancestry the of of the bees. So their their early forebears were such parasitoid wasps. And at some point, there must have been the switch from a carnivorous to a strictly vegetarian or vegan lifestyle. Mm -hmm. and, and and this and this, how much has changed, I guess, over the millions of years between when we see in the you know early going, so so the the kind of uh, the ancestor, and then you have them in the Jurassic and Jurassic, and then as we go through all the different you know, uh, stages of the Earth or periods of the Earth. Did the how I mean, there's different types of bees, obviously, but the current bees we have on the planet, do they look, do they look so dissimilar now than they did millions of years ago, or or was there not too much of a change, or in terms of just overall, how how what's the constancy there, if any? Um. So today's diversity of bees includes about twenty or thirty thousand species. Mm -hmm. the vast majority of which are solitary and only a few of them are social. And of course, we don't have that uh, a complete record of, of the diversity of bees 100 or 200 million years ago. The few fossils of 
solitary and social bees that I've seen in Ember are shockingly similar to the bees as we know them now. Wow. Wow. Um, so very, very similar. And it's it's uh, it's really blows the mind to see these hundreds of million years old um fossils look so similar to extant bees especially since we understand or we're learning more now that the earth was quite different uh 65 million 70 million 100 million years ago um it was there's all these different periods and in, in the climate and um different different types of uh environments where where animals would live and so it's it's, it's very interesting to see how there's not much yeah. change you, you see this in the ocean with some some creatures but it's interesting on, on land yeah. I mean, <laughs> indeed of course the bees contributed to some of the ways in which the world changed mm -hmm. because because obviously before bees or other pollinating insects, there were no flowers. Mm -hmm. So the entire terrestrial environment would have been largely green. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, once flowers had capitalized on, or plants had capitalized on the, the ability of um, pollinating insects to transport pollen, and in that way flowers, of course, got around this handicap of of immobility then of course you had ever more uh, glamorous flower signals that were meant to attract and also to be memorable by insect pollinators mm -hmm. and so before plants invented this trick of course and before pollinators were in existence there wouldn't have been much point mm -hmm. yeah yeah so again many different categories so let's kind of talk about the senses so the big one obviously that you talk about early on in the book is about vision um so just kind of give us the 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 main main piece here about uh vision in bees because it's really really interesting with all the different things about the how they have uh the polarization uh filters uh, we can talk about the how they use the sun as a compass uh you can talk about the there's their aspects of color so many really cool things about vision in bees so 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 just tell us uh kind of i guess the the main arc and then we can get into some of the finer details yeah so i mean one of the several things in bees vision that are profoundly different from how we see the world is the spectrum of colors that they can see so bees can see ultraviolet light which we cannot it's the kind of shortwave radiation that gives us sunburn, but we can't actually see it, but bees can. On the other hand, at the long wave end of the spectrum, red and beyond, bees don't see as far into long waves as humans do. So their entire visual spectrum is shifted to shorter wavelengths. Mm. And while at a glance, that might just be a sort of small um if you just consider the big range of electromagnetic radiation that might be a relatively minor shift but it actually means that they perceive their environment in completely different ways to the way we do because there are so many ultraviolet signals in our environment that entirely escape us and that includes the the patterns of the flowers so many flowers that for example seem single colored to us many yellow flowers for example are in fact two colored for bees because one part of the flowers let's say the tips of the petals are all both yellow and uv reflecting while the center might be equally yellow to us but uv absorbing for bees mm. and this is interesting because i think already this observation that there are patterns in flowers, for example, that bees can see and we can't, is a sobering insight when you think that people often consider that the world we see is somehow comprehensive, that we think it's the real world, that we um, somehow through our senses capture everything there is to capture in our environment. And of course, different animals see very different aspects of the same environment. Right. And so given whatever evolutionary filters they have, have acquired to um, help them survive in their particular niche, that's the aspects of their environment that they see, but they might 
miss some others. And that's clearly the case for us with the many ultraviolet patterns that are, that are seen both in plants, but also in many um, animal color displays. But that's not the only thing. You've already mentioned polarization vision. And that's the um, the capacity to see essentially the direction in which light swings. So you might recall from from physics that light has wave properties, mm -hmm. and that essentially means that it swings in a particular direction. Like like um, well, like your te I remember my teacher attaching a a rope to a hook on the wall and then swinging the rope up and down. And then, of course, it swings in one direction, not another one. Mm. And, and light has exactly such properties. And we can't see the direction in which light swings. Mm -hmm. That is the direction in which it's polarized. But insects can, and that includes the, the bees. And, mm. and um, this is a tremendously useful ability for a navigating animal. Um, bees also use a sun compass when they fly between a uh, their their nest or hive and a flower patch. They they orient themselves relative to the sun, and that of course means also they have to know what time of day it is. But we can come back to that a little bit later. But you might instantly spot the the obvious obstacle that the sun is not always always visible. So mm -hmm. the sun might be behind a mountain top, or it might be early in the morning and it's still behind the horizon, or it's obscured by clouds. And so there might only be some patches of blue sky visible. But usefully for the bees, this pattern of polarized light in the sky moves with the sun. So if you can, if you just have a few blue patches of sky and can see in which ways the light is polarized in these patches, that allows you to reconstruct the position of the sun, even if you can't see it. And so this ability to see polarized light is tremendously useful to as a backup system for your compass if you're using a sun compass. Mm. That, of course, is, an, is a, an ability that entirely escapes us humans. Is there an element of visual memory that's there for bees, especially with the sun compass, where they're they're having to understand, or even for when they're pollinating or, or with 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 flowers, how how much does their visual memory uh, um, activate it for for with, whether they're flying or whether they're you know on uh, various flowers or or doing other types of activities? How much does that come into play, if at all? So there are multiple things to consider. So in addition to this compass system, they also remember landmarks and the visual appearance of their nest and its surroundings. Um, and of course, sequences of landmarks that might guide them, let's say, from their home base to a familiar flower patch. Mm -hmm. Um I don't know if your question also aimed in the direction of whether they actually need to remember the course of the sun itself. And to some extent, mm -hmm. they, they have to do that because, mm -hmm. um, of course, when you're a bee that grows up in the darkness of the hive, um, you don't necessarily, you're not furnished with any kind of information about the course of the sun. Um, so you have to individually acquire it. And mm. indeed, bees can do that. And if you make um, deliberate um, experiments to disturb their alignment of the their memorized course of the sun with their their sense of time, then you you get predictable results. So for example, what you can do is take a bee hive that's uh, established in in Europe and then fly it to, let's say, New York, in which case, of course, the alignment of their internal clock with the sun compass is is misaligned. Right. So they they would expect, given their internal clock before they've readjusted to their jet lag, um, they would misjudge where the sun currently is. And indeed, it turns out that they would initially then fly um, a 90 degree departure from the course that they would have memorized 
from the European shores. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's so so interesting. That's so so interesting. So, how, how did uh, you, you say in the book? You talk about the phylogenetic analysis. You don't have to go super into it, but how, how do flower colors adapt to insect color vision? How, what's tell us about that that relationship, or or if there is this, that that co evolution of sorts? Yeah. So one of my early studies as a PhD student was actually modeling optimal color vision systems. Mm. And this basically consisted of me measuring the reflectance spectra of lots of different flowers, feeding them into a computer simulation and the model that I built myself, and then asking the computer, okay, now find me the best possible color vision system for coding these flowers, for detecting them, for discriminating them from each other, and so on. And it turned out that the computer built exactly the same color vision system that we already knew existed in bees. Mm. And that seemed to support um, a long-standing notion that there has been co-evolution between bee color vision and flower colors, that they sort of evolved hand in hand and that perhaps from an ancestor that didn't, for example, have UV receptors, they gradually, the bees might have gradually evolved this ability to see UV and flowers might have gradually increased their um, ability to, to um, reflect ultraviolet light. Mm. But of course, the fact that the, that the sensory system is optimal for coding flowers doesn't actually formally prove that there had been this simultaneous co-evolution. Okay. And so the phylogenetic analysis that you've mentioned basically is a, is a way that biologists use to open windows into the past and ask from deducing backwards from existing species, mm -hmm what might have been the, the features of the ancestral species. And so, for example, where all of the species in a certain group share a certain trait, let's say, for example, you're looking at mammals and they all have mammary glands, right. then you would, you would deduce from that that the common ancestor of all the mammals already had mammary glands rather than postulating, well, they stayed without them until um, 3,000 years ago, and then all of them independently involved mammary glands. Mm -hmm. And in the same way, as if you see that um, the vast majority of um, birds have wings, you would imagine that some ancestor of, the, of today's birds already had wings. And of course, you can do to some extent the same with sensory systems. And that's mm -hmm. what we did with, for example, the capacity to see ultraviolet light and also the other color receptors that exist in insects such as blue and green receptors. And it turns out that they're not unique to the bees. Actually, the vast majority of insects have not just ultraviolet receptors, but also blue and green receptors, pretty much with the same wavelength tuning as the bees do. And because we know how old insects are, that is, they actually date back all the way to the Cam Cambrian, so 500 million years ago, um, it appears from these comparative phylogenetic analyses that the ability to see ultraviolet in combination with blue and green actually dates back to the Cambrian. Mm. This is also supported by molecular biologists, analyses who compare the sequences of the proteins or the DNA that um, that generates them um, between different extant species. And that way you can, again, deduce how long ago these lineages of different types of color receptors or the proteins needed for them um, split up. And again, that points to um, the fact that these UV blue and green receptors are much, much hundreds of million years older than the bees are, and indeed hundreds of million of years older than flowers are. Mm. And so what that means is that a color vision system like the ones that bees have today and already had presumably 200 million years ago, 
um, was already present hundreds of million years before flowers ever graced the planet. And so the take home message there is bee color vision. We have no good evidence that bee color vision adapted to code for flower colors, but the other way around, the color vision system was already there mm. and flowers used the fact that bees can, bees, other insects can see ultraviolet light and then signaled in that spectral domain as well. That's super fascinating. And again, it makes you look at <laughs> flowers uh, or maybe plants in a, in a different light. Um, probably no one can probably say definitively, but there, there has to be, or there must seem to be, the natural question I have after that is as well, if, if, if bees weren't around, would flowers not that they wouldn't exist but would they be different would it look different would it be is there a kind of what's the type of relationship between you know if, if color vision was first vision in general with with bees you know how much of that you know is really influenced on different types of flowers i mean probably you know that's a you know a million dollar question right no one can really answer maybe but what do we think about in, in terms of that ongoing relationship over millions of years especially if they were the uh, precursors to flowers yeah I mean, there, there are of course other animals that pollinate flowers mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, not all of them are insects for example and so some of them many flowers are pollinated by birds various mm -hmm. different kinds of birds in different parts of the world um, hummingbirds here in in the new world and of course, the flowers that are visited by hummingbirds are, at least on average, different from those typically visited by bees. So these flowers pollinated by hummingbirds are often adapted in shape to fit around hummingbirds' beaks and heads. And so they're very long tubed. They often provide nectar that's actually more diluted because hummingbirds like uh, more diluted nectar than, than bees do and so on. And, of course, there is a, a popular color used by many plants, not all, but many plants that cater to hummingbirds, and that's red. And that clearly is different from the vast majority of bee-pollinated flowers, which are not red because bees are not particularly good seeing flowers that, are, that signal only in the red. And so for different pollinators, animal pollinators that have different sensory systems and different morphologies, of course, you have to generate different flowers. So if mm. you if you had a world without bees and and where they would they might only be bird pollinators or bat pollinators, for example, bat, bat flowers are yet different, of course, but th there are flowers that are specialized for catering to to nectar drinking bats. Mm. So you might have all of these, but um, but but um, they would they're very different from bee pollinated flowers. Now, for all we know, of course, these vertebrate pollinated flowers typically evolved from bee pollinated flowers. Mm. So we don't know if and when plants might have come up with the invention of recruiting animals for pollination purposes without her, there having been a, a history of, of bee pollination. Mm. And so the flowers catering to hummingbirds or bats might have ended up differently had it not been for that history of bee pollinated flowers. Mm -hmm. But that really is a is speculation. Yeah. I want to come back to pollination just because that's what a lot of people think about bees and flowers and as a major, major function. But I, I think it might be important to just briefly talk about some of the features of the antennae of bees. And you talk about uh, chemoreception and mechnosensors. I believe I have that right. Uh, so maybe just talk about that because I'm, assume, I'm assuming that's in play too with their pollinating. So it's obviously vision, but it's also their antennae and other uh, features. So maybe just talk about the specifics of their antennae. Yeah, so antenna are weird, of course, in that um, compared to to our sensory apparatus, they're like these leg length 
extensions that protrude from the head right. and are they of course have multiple sensory purposes so one i mean they they they're often called feelers in in popular language and that's one of their functions to is a tactile sense to um feel your way around the darkness of your nest but also flower structures so often flowers are quite um elaborate puzzle boxes where you have to find your way through and nudge petals apart vertically or horizontally and find the 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 path to the nectar or pollen and the surfaces of flowers are often very fine grained uh, very elegant structures that you can use to feel your way to the the nectar so these are microscopic structures but the mechanosensors in the antenna are so sensitive that bees indeed can learn to use these structures to find their way um around the the flowers but in addition to this mechanosensory feeler function these are also a bee's noses so they can smell with their antenna they can taste with them and even sense um electric fields with them mm. so they're they're highly sensitive for a variety of different kinds of um sensory modalities the chemosensory part is especially important of course in social bees because in the darkness of the nest visual communication is impossible and often chemosensory communication takes its place so they have to be good at sensing for example at, if they're guard bees at the entrance of a hive or a nest they have to be able to using their sense of of smell telling friend from foe so there could be a and a wasp trying to intrude into the hive but even bees from other hives might be trying to sneak past the guards and steal nectar and so on so you have to be very good at um at smelling who is who mm -hmm. and inside the the hive you have to respond to all kinds of pheromones these are chemicals that um are used in communication but for example between the queens the queen and workers um as well as between um larvae and workers so the larvae might signal that they're hungry also between different bees of course there are a variety of pheromones like an alarm pheromone if the hive is under threat that is released or um an attractive pheromone that um with the bees can used to signal that there is a reward or the hive entrance there and all these kinds of chemical substances are what a bee has to be good at detecting and distinguishing from other chemicals and so on so the antenna do all of this mm. so with the with with vision and then the antenna that you've been des describing when it comes to pollination and cross pollination how do they use parallel or serial processing? Uh, what's the the role of, of flower discrimination, and how do they utilize simple associative learning and different strategies for pollination? So flowers, of course, differ in their rewards. Different mm -hmm. flower species have different quantities and qualities of nectar and pollen, mm -hmm. and so bees essentially have to be careful shoppers in the flower supermarket that is mm -hmm. very much like us comparing products let's say in different shops looking at the price tags uh, and the the value we get for the money mm -hmm. the bee has to measure the the quality of the rewards that she is being offered by different flower species or different patches of flower species and then use the advertisement that the the flowers put out there that is the colors the patterns the scents and so on for for memorizing what are the most rewarding flowers so in the same way as you might have discovered a, a particular brand of of toothpaste that you've come to prefer because it's good and cheap you you know what to look for when you enter a supermarket and pick the same product again mm -hmm. and in the same way bees can remember that ah, it's these yellow star-shaped flowers that are 
the most rewarding. So I'll go for more of these to find more reward. Unless the situation changes, the price tag goes up. So there might be fewer of these flowers around, or maybe there's so much uh, competition that the quality has gone down. And in that case, the bee has to re-explore and find new food sources. And of course, bees use all the senses that, that are at their disposition to make these judgments. So they have to, um, or can use the, the scent, the, 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 the colors of the flowers, the, the way the flowers feel using their tactile sense, electric fields surrounding the flowers and so on. And all of these together, of course, are processed by, by a bee and used for remembering and relocating the flowers that they have in the past experienced as rewarding. Now, some sensory abilities, you mentioned parallel and serial processing, some such things can be taken in at once. Let's say, for example, if you memorize the the image of a flower, you might be able to take the entire image at a glance. Um, others, of course, by their very nature, are more sequential. So if you're using your antenna to feel your way around a flower, then, of course, these the information is taken in gradually over time. And some such sequential processing might also happen in vision when you're gradually scanning a flower, for example. But let's say in the tactile sense, it's quite obvious that the, the, the bits you, you take in, in each unit time differ from one moment to the next. And only by sequentially taking it in might you get the, the comprehensive information that you need to manipulate the flower, for example, um, in a way that gets you to the reward most efficiently. Hmm. I think it's it's super interesting how when I when I look at a bee uh, again in, in in you know in my yard or whatever, and I, I we have flowers in, in in the yard, and I'm always wondering. Again, I'm a layperson. I don't I don't study bees professionally, but I always wonder what are they up to? They're just kind of hovering around the flower, and you know they kind of you know bounce around and they go to one side of the flower and then you know they might go to one nearby and they, if you kind of just watch you know for five minutes ten minutes there's a there's definitely stuff going on right if you're just a total lay person you can say like this isn't random this isn't like you know fishing around like there does seem to be some kind of um you know intentionality if you will going on there so it's, it's interesting here you describe all of these very uh specific things uh, it just, again, it's another, at least for a layperson, big appreciation for, obviously, we know that their their role is super important, but, you know, that there's other things going on. Um, okay, so you, you've mentioned this. You've mentioned about uh, uh, that not all bees are social. Now, I think most people would think that they are, right? They would talk about the queen bee. We talk about, like, the, the hive. We talk about all, all these uh, features, but... Um, not all all bees are social in, in that way. So, what again, kind of like I, uh, my earlier question, just what's kind of the evolutionary role of sociality in bees, and then how do they, um, how do we know which ones are aren't, and how do they engage in social learning? So, just kind of talk about the sociality piece of bees. So, the most familiar bees to most people, I guess, are the honeybees. Mm -hmm. They're they're familiar because. They generate honey. For one thing, they're kept by humans and have been kept for millennia all over the world in in different ways. And so these are the kinds of bees that that most people are familiar with. Um, there are other social bees that many people also know, such as bumblebees, for example. Mm -hmm. The big ones, right? Um, they're really big. They're often really big, mm -hmm. um, the, especially their queens, of course, are... are um, are amongst the biggest insects that we we might um, see uh, in any kind of meadow. Mm. There are, however, some some solitary bees that that uh, are equally big uh, as the bumblebee queens. But by and large, mm. bumblebees are 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 furry. They sort of look like little flying teddy bears to to many people. But they are social, like honeybees. They have a queen. Um, and a worker caste um, and a separate um, 
cast of, of males, of course. Mm -hmm. Now, in bumblebees, the, as opposed to honeybees, there is already a kind of mixture between a solitary and a social lifestyle in that honeybees have these huge surplus stores of, of honey, which makes them popular with, with beekeepers, of course, because they store so much honey and that allows them to overwinter as a colony. Whereas bumblebees don't do that. The entire um, nest collapses at the end of summer or early autumn, and it's only the fertilized queens that overwinter. Mm. They start their lives in the subsequent spring as solitary individuals. They found a colony all of their own, and they have to be a bit of a jack of all trades because at the start, there's no workers to help them. So... They have to locate a suitable cavity for a nest, typically an abandoned mouse hole or that sort of um, hollow space. And then they'll build a, a small wax construction for a honey pot and perhaps for um, a pot for their first few eggs. They have to collect nesting material to make sure it's, it's warm in there and keep the brood warm, defend it from predators, um, if that need should arise. And they have to visit flowers, of course. And it's only several weeks later, once their first workers hatch, that they'll have any kind of help. And then there's a transition um, to a more and more social lifestyle, where eventually the queen turns to being a cave animal and, and the workers take on all the outside foraging. But this lifestyle that the bumblebee queen leads early in her nest development is actually what governs the entire lives of all these tens of thousands of solitary bee species, mm. all of which are essentially single mothers. So the, the males and bees are pretty useless for most um, anything but one thing. Um, and um, so in these solitary bee species, invariably it's the... The, the female that constructs the nest and provides the brood with with young, uh, with the brood with, with food, uh, and then eventually seals the nest and um, leaves the, the um, offspring to, to feed on the provisions that she's collected for them. And there is a huge diversity of different kinds of solitary bees their nesting habits are very different some uh, drill holes in wood or use existing holes in wood dr drilled by other insects others nest in um, abandoned snail um, houses sh shells and um, and others nest in in the ground digging little burrows and so on and they also have very different flower specializations. Some seem to um, concentrate all their foraging on just a very small number of flower species. Others are more generalist and have to learn which flowers are the most rewarding. Hmm. It's interesting how there's, even for solitary bees, there is some uh, impact from more social bees, as you were saying. This is a very interesting way of, 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 of thinking about that. I want to move from sociality to brains because this was super fascinating to me um i i mean i, I understand uh, you know cursory uh, understanding of brains and other animals i know a handful of things obviously within the human brain um but i guess my just one question i have is i mean uh, <laughs> a bee is very small it's very 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 small what does a brain look like in a bee? I mean, the human brain is three pounds, right? You know, and, you know, we're, you know, small relative to, you know, mammals of the ocean and things like that. But I can't conceptualize what a brain is like in a bee's head. Like, <laughs> could you, could you, well, I have a few other questions about it, but just kind of, just, just kind of conceptually here. What is, how does that work? <laughs> So bee brains are undoubtedly small. Um, you're right about that. But they are, of course, very elegantly miniaturized and that all their 
components, the nerve cells and the wiring between them is also much smaller. Mm. So it's not just that, as if you would take a cubic millimeter of any part of a human brain and stick this, mm. leaving the neuron sizes the same um, into an insect brain, but everything is a lot smaller. And I think there is a certain fallacy in thinking that the computational equipment that's small mm -hmm. is somehow more simple. Of course, if we actually think about man-made computing devices, you you would never walk into an Apple store saying, can I please buy the, the heaviest or most <laughs> voluminous computer that you have in store? What you want instead is you want mm -hmm. everything elegantly miniaturized as, let's say, in a mobile phone. Mm -hmm. And I guess the development of computing equipment over the last few decades shows us that with a lot of creative thinking, you can actually make things a lot smaller while getting the same or even better computational mm -hmm. power than you might have imagined th some some decades ago. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, that, that happens in insect brains. That is, yes, they're very small, but there is a lot going on in them. So first of all, in terms of just neural numbers, there's about a million nerve cells in a bee's brain, and that indeed is a diminutively small number compared to the 85 billion mm -hmm. um, neurons, nerve cells in, in a human brain. Mm -hmm. But we're still a very, very long way to understand, well, even a drosophila, let alone a bee brain, in a comprehensive manner. And the reason is that the, even though the number of components is small, the wiring diagram is still far too complex for any scientist or team of scientists to understand comprehensively in terms of its functionality. Mm. And that's in part because every single nerve cell is not just one transistor or something, if you want to borrow an analogy from computing equipment. But of course, the, 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 the branching patterns of dendrites and axonal outgrowths are extremely complex mm. and so each individual nerve cell if you look at the structure in an insect brain um, might be as finely branched as a as a fully grown oak tree mm. just very very small and every single nerve cell might make up to ten thousand connections with other nerve cells in the brain and of mm. course if you then think that each of these synaptic connection points is also at least potentially plastic and subject to experience and learning, you've got a very, very complex and finely branched wiring diagram that um, that underpins all these very impressive cognitive capacities that we've identified in bees, but how it's actually mediated by the circuitry um, is, is still a long way from understanding. But just to give you a sense of, of the complexity, so there are, even in the fly's visual system, about 150 identified neuron types, different, different identified types of nerve cells. Mm. There are about 80 in the human retina. So mm. the visual periphery of a, of a fruit fly, as tiny as it is, in a sense, is more complex Mm. Than than is the the retina of a human. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it, it's what you, what I'm what I'm gathering is that it's the 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 brain in a, in a bee is proportionate proportional to its size, and it's very densely packed. So I think of I've, I've talked to some folks that study birds, and they, they basically say the same thing. Bird brains are very small um, in size, but it's very densely packed and very complex, and of course proportionate to their to their uh, to their body. You yeah. you, men you mentioned in the in the book about proto cerebral bridge, which is a fan shaped body, ellipsoid body, and and not nodule. Uh, in this system, is bees' brains similar to like a human's uh, prefrontal cortex or basal ganglia, or is it just something entirely uh, uh, different or unique to bees? Well, I think the the structure is not homologous. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. So if we consider that the, the last common ancestor of insects and vertebrates was uh, probably a simple worm with yeah. without any kinds of legs or perhaps an advanced sensory system, then everything we see in insects and um, and invertebrates would have had to um, arise by convergent evolution, independent inventions mm -hmm. of these neural structures and sensory systems and so on in uh, the clade of the vertebrates on the one hand and the insects or bro more broadly invertebrates on the other hand. So if anything, there are structures which are functionally similar, but but they are not based on a common ancestor uh, brain structure that have, have been slightly modified. Mm. Mm. So we find, uh, again, in this central complex, including the protocerebral bridge, some similarities to, let's say, the human hippocampus in terms of um, its mediating navigational capacities, but also, of course, some unique functions in the insect. So, for example, the um, central analysis of the polarized sky dome and its integration with the sun compass and so on is, is mediated there in that central complex. And that, of course, is a function that's entirely absent in, in the mammalian brain. It, with with moving from the the kind of more anatomical aspects of the brain, what do we? This is a question that I've asked different folks that study animal minds and stuff, and everyone gets all different answers. But um, you know, it's a it's a longer discussion, right? Which we you know we don't have to have that very long footnote. But you know, sometimes people are curious about intelligence, right? Uh, or cognitive abilities or you know what have you and for bees you're i mean we've talked about many things we've talked about you know uh, um, selection and memory and you know obviously vision and sorting and you know all the discrimination all these different things uh we talked about their sociality piece so i'll just make a general question what what do you what are your thoughts or what can we know about the intelligence of of bees and 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 how is it maybe uh, different for different bees right so i've already covered a variety of learning abilities that we find in bees including their spatial navigation and their ability to memorize the signals that characterize the most rewarding flowers but if i talked about these learning abilities to colleagues in researching primates and, and parrots and so on, they were often a bit dismissive and said, well, okay, a bee has to do these things because that's what a bee needs on a daily basis. She has to be good at recognizing flowers, but they weren't very impressed because so they said that in primates, the whole point of using, of designing an intelligence test is to confront them with something that they haven't had to solve right. on a daily basis in their evolutionary history. And right. some of my colleagues a few years ago were working on a string pulling task in parrots where that's this is a common animal intelligence test. You have to pull on a string to retrieve an object that's otherwise out of reach and typically there's some food to be had. And I sort of flippantly commented, I bet our bees can do that. And everyone in the room sort of looked at me like, okay, now Lars has gone mad completely. But um, <laughs> so I had a few courageous young people in the lab who were willing to try. And so they built an arrangement where we had some artificial flowers, just discs with a central nectar mm -hmm. well with sugar water, with a string attached to this artificial flower. And the whole flower was 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 um, under a glass table. So bees could see these artificial flowers, but not get to them unless they pulled on a string. And it turned out that the bees could learn this just fine, to pull a string to get to the flower. But not only that, they could also learn it by observing each other. So once we had trained the bee to solve the task, 
then other bees could learn it by by copying the technique that they had seen the experienced bees deliver. And you could then see this technique of spring string pulling see spread through other individuals in a colony like a social media meme, like a, a, a meme spreads through a social network of people so that gradually all the individuals in a colony or the majority of them would pick up that skill and it would even continue spreading after the individual individuals, the, the individual demonstrators who first learned the technique had died. Bees only live a few weeks, so it's natural for them to die in the course of an experiment. But the technique kept spreading through the colonies in a like in a, through several sequential generations, so to speak, of of trained individuals that were then able to pass on the technique to previously naive individuals. Mm. And so that was a the first indicator of a of a task where you could clearly say, well, okay, this is something that a bee in its evolutionary history, mm -hmm. no individual has had to do that. Nonetheless, the bees could solve it. Mm. And we've since expanded on these string pulling paradigms with various other tasks that involved some form of object manipulation. So in one task, the, the bees were asked to roll a little ball over a horizontal surface to a goal area. And if they'd done that, they would get a little sugar reward. So that we we still capitalize on bees um, liking for sugar rewards, which they have in nature. So the, if a bee gets something right, she always gets a little droplet of sugar water in our experiments. And in this ball rolling task, a special twist that we introduced, we were again interested in the question of social learning. How can bees learn such a technique from it by observing skilled conspecifics, even if they previously had no experience with that task by themselves? And so what we did there was we had three balls, all at different dif distances from the goal. And obviously, the best way to solve the task is to pick the closest ball and move that to the goal area, the target. But the trick was that this experienced bee that in the couple between experienced and naive being, that experienced individual knew I can't move those closest balls because they were actually glued to the surface. So that bee learned I can only move the furthest ball, right? So that's what she always demonstrated to the naive individual, moving the furthest ball to the goal area. And so we had them in a pair three times, the experienced bee move, moving that furthest ball, and the naive bee just looking, and at the end, they both got a reward when the ball was in the target area. And then we put the naive bee on the spot and asked her, okay, now you're alone. You've never rolled a ball for your reward, but how do you solve this task? And there was two ways, basically, that individual could respond. One is to basically ape the demonstrator and copy the actions, move the furthest ball, or you could invent a better solution to the same task, that is, you pick the closest ball. And in this test, now none of the balls were glued. They were all freely movable. And we asked that, that B that had no previous experience with rolling balls for reward, how do you solve it? And remarkably, they didn't just copy what the demonstrator did. They did not move the furthest ball, but spontaneously improved by moving the closest ball to the target area. And this to us indicates that at some level, there must have been an understanding of the desired outcome of the task, rather than that observer be just copying what she had seen the other bee perform. Wow. I mean, wow. I mean, that's, I mean, those, when we think about how anybody is defining intelligence, you know, just, you know, solving, uh, problems in novel situations, um, you know, and, and some type of, of, you know, the decision-making capacity and some type of, you know, discrimination processes and how we're trying to organize that. I mean, that th those experiments, which are super amazing because they're outside the box, I mean, you have to 
I, I would say, based on hearing that alone, you have to argue that there's some form of intelligence for bees. Maybe it's not this much, you know, this, this, you know, super amount or lower amount or whatever, but they're, because that's not just learning, right? So people like to make this distinction with, with various animals. Um, <clears throat> oh yeah, they can learn, you know, there's a kind of associative or instrumental or observational learning. Learning is just, you watch and you just repeat. No, no, no. You know, intelligence is more than that. And kind of in the first example, I mean, that sounds like a lot of social cognition, right? You know, watching another uh, bee or uh, bees do something. And then in the, the last example you gave, some form of executive functioning, how you're planning and sequencing and kind of organizing things. I mean, that's, 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 that takes certain, certain IQ points to do that. So that's, that's what it seems to me. But do, do people, where do people fall on this? You know, these, these studies that have been done, uh, you know, do people say, yeah, well, maybe, 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 or do people say, yes, you know, this is maybe indicative that bees are intelligent. So I've had very encouraging responses in the last few years from primate people who historically, as you say, have, have um, been a bit dismissive about the possibility that um, a bee might have intelligence. Um, but very movingly for me, for example, once after we published this ball rolling mm -hmm. study, um, we were sent a little video clip from... Um, Jane Goodall. Oh wow! This I think was a, a she appeared in some sort of master class mm -hmm. um, project on animal intelligence more more generally, and so she referred to this ball rolling experiment as mm -hmm. as mind blowing, and um, in the end concluded that that um, she would like to be young now and explore all these things and insects because there's so much mm. undiscovered stuff that could be found out and mm. and um that was very moving and inspiring for me because jane goodall and others like her of her generation were sort of the, the motivation for me to go into sure. animal behavior and so on so this is quite the compliment it's probably the, one of the highest compliments you can get so that's that's pretty that's pretty awesome mm -hmm. that's pretty awesome yeah. Um, so what about, we talked about intelligence here. So I guess I have, I have two or three more areas here. So just briefly about uh, personality. Um, so in many ways, uh, cognition or intelligence is the easy thing to study, right? I mean, it, it's, it's easy. You know, mo most people would say that, you know, it definitely is for humans. Um, personality is all the, oh, all the abstraction and the, the gray and the ambiguity and like, what is it? And like, you know, people still fight about, you know, personality, what it is and what it isn't. Um, so how, how do we understand about bees having distinct personalities and how they could be, um, heritable and, and where do we see how this comes into play with how they, you know, enact division of labor? Uh, what can you say about bees and their personality? Yeah, so I think as you picked up, I think there is some something slightly funny about referring to animal personality when they're clearly not persons, um, they're right, members right. of a different species. Mm -hmm. But I think, so I often use the term in quotation marks mm -hmm. because the concept in a sense is useful but um, but I think more parsimoniously, it's it's important to recognize that individual animals are different yeah. from each other, and that is distinct from a popular viewpoint some decades ago when people used to just average all the animals that um, they tested together and th and thought that okay, you only get the the species picture if if uh, you sort of average out all the noise and all the, the people viewed variation between individuals as noise or the, the majority did, there were exceptions. Mm. Um, one of whom I, I need to mention this here is Charles Turner, an African-American scientist who was active over a century ago and who was, I think, the first to recognize that there were clear inter-individual differences between Invertebrates. His first mm. paper was was about spiders, published at the age of his age of 
25, late in the 19th century, and he th observed clear differences in spiders' ability of uh, weaving their webs in different sort of spatially mm. challenged positions. And, um, and one of the threads all through Turner's work is recognizing such individual differences between members of the same species. So he published learning curves for individual ants solving certain spatial problems and individual cockroaches and so on. Mm. So this was a, a thread through his entire work. And for all the wrong reasons, this work has been mm. forgotten or largely forgotten um, mm. until relatively recently. Mm. Mm. But we've, I guess, picked up the thread and some others in, in evaluating such differences thoroughly by looking in, at individuals' behavior throughout their, their lives and their foraging careers. And indeed, it turns out that individual bees are very different from other individual bees of the same species in almost every behavioral or psychological trait that you could measure that includes the, their learning ability for things like colors or scents, but also more, some of the more complex tasks that had already mentioned, such as the, the string pulling task, where, for example, the vast majority of individuals, of, we trained over 100, but they needed individual training in a stepwise manner where these flowers are first made openly accessible and then gradually pushed under the glass table, and they learn it step by step or by observing conspecifics that have already been trained. But we had two individuals that solved the task spontaneously without any kind of training. They figured it out all by themselves. Mm. And we, we sometimes have sort of individual Einstein bees that have become especially good at a certain task in ways that are not actually accomplished by any other individuals in that particular experiment. So I can tell you one interesting anecdote where a long time ago, we did an experiment where we measured bees' foraging activity by weighing the bees on departure from the hive to a flower meadow and again on the way back. And by, by recording the time that they had spent at visiting natural flowers and the weight gain that they had accomplished while foraging at the flowers, so dividing the, the weight gain by the time it took them, we were able to figure out um how much they'd collected over time mm. but this required us briefly capturing the bees in a container putting them on the scales then releasing them on departure from the nest and doing the same again when they arrived and mm. most bees initial response to being briefly captured of course is the threat to escape it and they were a little bit aggressive they got used to that after a time but we had one individual bee that um, would actually learn to fly directly into the container after a time, even if we held the container a few meters away, up in the air, away mm. from the nest, she would return by flying directly into that container, basically coming to expect this as a kind of mode of public transport to be deposited back into the nest. Mm. And um, so that was unique to that particular individual and no other one did that. But even with um, entirely different traits, including, for example, the response to novel objects, neophobia or neurophilia, there are consistent inter-individual differences if you measure them rigorously enough. And you mentioned that there is some, there might be some heritability, and that too turns out to be the case. So First of all, if you measure multiple individuals of individual nests or colonies, you do find that even though there's variation in each nest, there's also an average that is nest-specific with some variation around that. And this is also heritable. So some other people have done experiments on the heritability of learning speed for flower odors, for example, and it turns out that not only are certain hives faster at associating orders with rewards, but this is also heritable to to the next generation of bees. So it's it's subject to to selection, um, and and it's heritable. Mm. 
It's so again, it's so interesting. I agree with you about the whole like personality thing, and you know, it's 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 a, it's a kind of an anthropomorphizing kind of piece of it, but that there is individual differences there and how they how they are. Uh, but it, it is interesting again. It, the, the personality stuff just kind of highlights or underlines the the individuality of them, which is really really fascinating. But my my last two questions I have are. Um, well, one's a probably a, a to be determined, I would imagine. But um, many people talk about consciousness, sentience. Um, you mentioned that there's an awareness of pain, some understanding of emotional experiences for bees, some idea of the self. How do we know these things? What are the extent of these features, and how do we continue to to explore that? You know, potentially bees are are conscious. Or, or have consciousness, excuse me. So this is a difficult question for any animal or or indeed any thing. So you might have mm-hmm. seen mm-hmm. recent discussions about the the question of when an artificial intelligence system might be said to be sentient or conscious. And it it is a difficult question in any animal or thing that isn't language gifted. So we humans, of course, can comment on our emotional states, on perceptual states, and so on. And so we have access to other people's minds because we can talk to them. We can do, do this with no other animal. And so in the same way as this is a difficult question for domestic dogs or primates or um, or other fam- more familiar animals, it's also a difficult question for, for insects. And mm-hmm. Descartes famously believed that, that, that no animals are conscious. He thought that they're all, in a sense, machines without any kind of thinking ability and so on. And that was not a stupid man. The, 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 the problem is that for any animal that we can't directly talk to, it's a challenge. And that yeah. includes even the, the the human animal, so to speak, in its early developmental stages. So um, you've mentioned pain. And up until the 1990s, in many countries, babies were operated, human babies were operated on without anesthesia because mm-hmm. people thought that they feel nothing. They they conceded that, well, yes, they're screaming and kicking, but that's all just reflexes and um, and they're, they're not actually suffering, nor, nor can they store any of this in, in their memory. Um, it's just um, the, a mechanical kind of response to, to these stimuli. Mm-hmm. And so in the same way as this is difficult for human babies to formally prove wrong but i think perceptions there have changed we now uh, do appreciate that there is a capacity for suffering or pain in babies but without formal proof we're just using common sense yeah. the fact that everything comes together there's not just grimacing or crying or, or kicking and so on but there is also changes of hormonal states mm-hmm. um that so all of these bits of evidence together now make us appreciate that there might be a form of suffering. And in the same vein, we need to use, there's still no accepted formal proof for consciousness in any entity other than the human being. But there are a variety of different lines of evidence that you can use to nudge probabilities in the right direction. So if you contrast a potentially conscious animal with one that lives entirely in the present, that only responds to incoming stimuli with a kind of Swiss Swiss Army knife toolkit of hardwired behavioral responses, then the question is, what what would you expect? So you would you would expect an animal that can somehow plan for the future that can look into the past and somehow flexibly use autobiographical memories to respond adaptively to new challenges, there's already a difference there to to an animal that that just responds to current things going on in its environment. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so we're we're using these kinds of intelligence tests not just to say, hey, that animal is really smart, but we're also interested in, in asking whether certain of these intelligence tests that we're using can actually only be solved by a form of thinking, some sort of mental exploration of a solution to a task rather than trial and error. Mm -hmm. So in this ball rolling task that I've mentioned earlier, these observer bees do not have a chance of trying to figure out the solution to the puzzle by trial and error. They spontaneously pick the closest balls, which to us indicates some sort of exploration of the task in the mind rather than by physically trial and error, and solving the task in some sort of form of mental exploration rather than just um, just well trial and error. And it's these kinds of tasks that I think at least make it very likely that there's some sort of thinking going on mm -hmm. rather than just some sort of um, a simple process that leads the animals to the solution. Mm -hmm. Now, you could say with these and a number of other different intelligence tests that my lab and others have done, well, all of this could be programmed into a robot. Mm -hmm. And you would be right. You could also program a robot to behave as if it's experiencing pain when, when you damage it. But the point there is that, yes, you'd have to make the, the effort to write that into the software that controls the robot. And the robot would be able to solve everything you tell it to do, but with some probability, not much else. So if, for example, you had built a machine either just in silico or, or as in a, as a kind of hardware implementation of a robot that delivered everything that was known about bees 10 years ago. So that robot would have been able to count. It would have been able to um, recognize flower patterns and so on. It might have been able to recognize images of human faces. All of these were things that were published until 10 years ago. But that robot most likely would have failed with the string pulling task and the ball rolling task and mm. several others that people have done in more recent years mm -hmm. because you hadn't actually instructed it to solve any of these tasks. Mm. Mm. And in the same way, okay, if I said today, all right, I'm, I'm updating my robot to do everything that a bee can do in 2022, I would predict that this robot would still fall flat on its face when it's going to be faced with a task that scientists would confront bees with in the next year, in the next two or three or five years. The, the robot would again would need an update every time, but, but our bees can do it already. We, we don't know yet what people will experiment on next year, but um, I'm sure that there'll be more to be discovered that we don't know yet, mm. but bees can will most likely be able to solve a number of more different surprising things that we can't yet imagine. Mm. And the reason I think is is that there is more than just a kind of behavior or even cognitive toolbox, but there is a more general intelligence that allows them to solve novel tasks that, as of today, we probably can't even imagine yet. Mm. But a robot programmed to do everything that's currently known would likely fail with these tasks. And that is the advantage of a real-life, versatile kind of intelligence as opposed to what we can currently implement in machines. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it, that, that goes to uh, part of my final question, so we, we, can, we can close that loop in, uh, in a minute. I guess the, the the last question I have for you here is 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 the one that is I think uh, urgent in some ways <clears throat> is many people uh, talk about the role of conservation for bees. Um, we have seen in different points that you know there's lots of bees that are dying or they're not reproducing as much. That's problematic for pollination in many things, but even outside of that, I mean, it's problematic for them as a species i mean we don't want species going extinct or becoming too endangered in general um so what in terms of the future 
of bees um, in conservation efforts and maybe the lack thereof in other other places. You know, what what do we you know, when you look into your crystal ball and you say, OK, what is what is the future of bees? What do you feel? What do you what do you think about the future of bees on the planet? You're right. So the the plight of bees, of course, has been all over the media in recent years. And the reason is in part, as opposed to other many other insects that are also out there and also in trouble, yeah. is the utility of bees, is the fact that, that we need bees to pollinate our crops. Every third bite that you eat is most likely in some way, directly or indirectly, um, dependent on on bee pollination and so with the bees gone or in trouble the all of this food would either be become very expensive or, or entirely out of reach i mean yes you can replace bees with mechanical pollination devices operated by humans but that would be superbly expensive and of and of course the, the the fact that we might have to do this would be an indicator of really large scale ecological disaster. So it's not mm-hmm. necessarily mm-hmm. something we should work towards. Yeah. Um, so bees are, as you say, in trouble because of large scale habitat destruction, because of industrialized agriculture, the fact that there are just not the floral resources around for be- that bees need to thrive but also not the, the the nesting possibilities. But in addition, and that comes in a package with um, a highly competitive industrial agriculture, um, are that many of the plants, of course, are solidly covered in pesticides and herbicides and so on that are designed to, to be, um, at least in the case of pesticides, designed to kill or harm insects. Mm. And, of course, the belief that they just harm the herbivorous insects that consume the leaves is naive because these yeah. uh, chemicals are also they leak into the flower and nectar and are harvested by bees and brought back into their colonies and they don't necessarily instantly kill but uh, often they do but not necessarily and more often than not they just um, slowly poison mm. bees and other insects um, in ways that make them in turn more susceptible to diseases and all of these factors come together to 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 be very harmful and bees in a sense are just a cannery in the coal mine they have a lobby um, in the form of beekeepers and of course us scientists and so on but of course many other insects are are equally affected and so there is a large scale um, ecological disaster that we're witnessing and in the case of bees, that's a direct disaster for humans as well, because we need them. Mm-hmm. But I think the the psychological work that we've done over the past few decades here adds another angle that needs to be considered. And that is, if we take a look at um, how we, how other conservation efforts are motivated, if you look at uh sort of icons like panda bears and siberian tigers is that we we empathize with them we we sense that they might Mm. feel their plight that they that they suffer from the deterioration of their habitat and perhaps from the the um the fact that they're lonely that it's often difficult for these um species on the brink of extinction to find mating partners or or social group partners and so on and this empathy motivates our conservation we we're we're um donating to such efforts because we think these these animals experience this as a as something negative and we don't yet have that sort of appreciation for for insects of course but yeah. i'm not saying we should abandon the 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 the, the motivator that pollinating bees are useful for us but i think in addition the fact that they're most likely sentient creatures um, is also important for considering just how much uh, Mm -hmm. uh, chemistry we we spray at them and so on and i think so in addition to the the fact that we need to rethink how we organize our agriculture i think it's also important that 
bees might very well be sentient beings and everyone can actually contribute a little to make their lives easier by planting bee friendly flowers that are that are, there's now plenty of internet resources on which flowers to plant for bees and we can make their lives a little easier and a little happier with with such things yeah yeah i i absolutely agree with you uh, i think it's really really important and and not just for their utility but just for them yeah, as 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 creatures that that uh you know uh, the planet's their home just as much as it is ours uh well the book is the mind of a bee um it's uh again as 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 listeners will probably have heard in this conversation it is um so much information in the book so many other things we didn't talk to again i can't uh highly recommend this enough this is it's a it's a really really wonderful book even if you're not interested in bees i think it's really really uh fantastic so um i know it's it's out everywhere where it can um people find you uh where are the right places to find you whether it's your papers or any anywhere online the best places to get at you so i think if people just google my name to my knowledge there's only one of me so it should be relatively <laughs> easy to find me and so you'll find my lab's web page and all my publications can be downloaded from it for free mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, help yourselves. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Lars, this was so much fun. Um, I really was looking forward to, to talking to you. I, I really loved your book. And so talking to you is, is just a bonus. And so I, I, I um, again, I'm, I'm really grateful for, for such a, a wonderful conversation. I appreciate it. All right. You're very welcome. Thank you. It was fun.